Hello, this is Jeremy Zimmerman from Colorado School of Mines, and today I'll be talking about crystallographic planes and Miller indices. This video will teach you about the basics of crystallographic planes, Miller indices, and families of planes. You might ask yourself why. The faces, or facets, of a crystal are often planes with high atomic density and low surface energy. Equivalent planes have the same energy, and they will form a family creating a crystal form, such as the parallel planes on the crystal shown at right. Later on in this class, we're going to talk about X-ray diffraction. Diffraction is often discussed in terms of reflections off planes of atoms. While this description is not complete, it is at least a motivation as to why we need to talk about planes. Furthermore, if you were to take an X-ray diffraction scan of a powdered material or a highly polycrystalline material, to first order, the diffraction peak intensity is proportional to the multiplicity of the family of the planes. Another important thing in crystals are defects. And Extended defects are very dependent on planes. For example, dislocations, a one-dimensional defect, move along glide planes, and you might guess that a glide plane is a crystallographic plane. Furthermore, there are two-dimensional defects, like twins and stacking faults, and these generally occur on specific planes as well. So we're going to need a way of describing planes in a consistent manner that allows us to apply symmetry operations and do calculations. After this video, you will be able to calculate the Miller indices for any crystallographic plane and identify all the members of a family of planes and the multiplicity of that family. We're going to use Miller notation to describe these planes. Miller notation uses round brackets to indicate a single plane and H, K, and L values, which will be integers, to represent the reciprocals of the axis intercepts. The process that we're using is going to be identical and the notation will be identical for all crystal systems. For a given plane, you're going to find the intercepts with the crystallographic axes, you're going to take the inverse of each intercept, you're going to take that set of inverses of the intercepts and reduce them to the smallest integer multiples and you're going to place them in brackets. A negative number is going to be indicated by a bar over that number. Let's practice this for the two planes I have shown at the right. We're going to assume that the origin is this bottom left atom here. And for the pink plane, the intercepts of the three crystallographic axes are at 1, 1, and 1. We'll take the inverse of these, again returning 1, 1, and 1. And we'll then take the smallest integer multiples of those and put it in round brackets, giving us the 1, 1, 1 plane. For the blue plane, we will assume the same origin. And the intercepts will be at 1 in the a direction, 1 in the b direction, and 2 in the c direction. So we'll take the inverse of each of those and get 1, 1, 1 half. We will then multiply those each by 2 to get the smallest integer multiples and place them in round brackets, giving the 2, 2, 1 plane. I'm going to do something a little bit more difficult now. We're going to assume the origin is this back bottom atom right here. So we're going to have a cubic cell and we're going to have a plane through the origin. If we were to go through the math we did on the last page, um, we would get infinity, infinity, and then I don't know what to do with the last one because it crosses at all values in the c-axis. So this isn't going to work. So what we're going to do is shift the plane off of the origin and calculate the intercepts. So the plane was the a minus b equals zero plane. Now if we shift it by a delta x of negative one, we're going to get a minus b equals one. So the origin is now this bottom left atom. So the intercepts will be negative 1 in the a direction, 1 in the b direction, and infinity in the c direction. The Miller index of this will be bar 1, 1, 0, or you might say that 1 bar, 1, 0. Now let's try it for a base-centered monoclinic lattice. The origin is going to be the back left bottom corner. So we're going to go with this atom right here. The intercepts will be negative one in the a direction. Uh, it's parallel to the b, so that will give you infinity. And then we're going to have to project up and see that this would um, cross the c-axis at two. So we'll take the inverse of all of these and you'll get negative one, zero, one half. We'll find the lowest common um, integer multiples and we'll get a 2 bar 0 1. All equivalent planes are going to form something called a family and the notation here is going to look a little bit different. 
and we still use H, K, and L, but we're going to put it in these curly round brackets. Equivalent planes are related by valid symmetry operations of the crystal space group. We haven't learned about this yet, but uh, we'll talk about it later on in the course. But for now, what we're going to think about is for a given lattice, is a particular HKL value unique? So we might be able to figure this out by exchanging the labeling of the axes. Does it change the shape or orientation of the unit cell? Does the spacing between equivalent parallel planes change? Or do the atoms present in or the spacing of atoms within a plane change? So I'm going to show you a couple uh, examples of this. So we're going to take a cubic cell to begin with, and we're going to put a 110 plane in this. If we then look to see what other planes might be equivalent to this, one of the options is to look at this 1 bar 1 0 plane. And these two are equivalent simply by rotation, and I'm going to show these in the third um, diagram. I'm showing both of them just with these red outlines of the two planes. Now these are not the only two planes that you could have picked. We could have also um, had them cross on the left and right faces or the front and back faces. So this is going to give you six planes, but in reality you could have a plane facing the front or the back of any of these planes, so you could get 12 members. And this is going to depend on, on details of the symmetry that we have not yet gotten to. Finally, if we look at a tetragonal cell and we look at this 110 plane, we can then see that this plane that I'm showing here, the 011 plane, is not equivalent. They have a different aspect ratio, um, different lengths, they would have different, might have different atoms in them, etc. So we can calculate the maximal multiplicity. So we're going to calculate the number of allowed HKL permutations, and then we're going to multiply that by the number of signed combinations. And finally, we just need to make sure that we've followed all the rules I gave above. So you're going to get somewhere between 1 and 48 equivalent planes per family. So I have some things I'd like you to think about. If a plane is parallel to an axis, what is the intercept? If two planes are parallel, will they have the same Miller indices? How does the Bravi lattice affect how we denote a single plane? List all the members of the 110 family of planes in a tetragonal unit cell. List all of the members of the 2 bar 0, 1 plane in a monoclinic cell. Now both of these are planes I showed you in this presentation. Finally, I'd like you to consider why we might use such an unusual way of defining planes in crystals. Thank you very much.